You're listening to the Corbett Report. So back to Brexit. Um, do you have? An, I've devoted the last week's program to Brexit, and this week's program is being devoted to Brexit. I read a piece by Glenn Ford about it that I may have sent you, and so now we want to hear your take as an expat, as an expatriate, on this Fourth of July. Um, I think it'll be an interesting way to look at it. So, would you like to lead with that? Well, to be fair, I'm an expat from Canada, not the United States. So, All right. Fourth of July doesn't mean much to me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I, I think the Brexit uh, debate that I've seen so far, both in the mainstream and in the alternative, has been well, confused. I think that it's stuck on stupid, really, because all of the commentary that I've seen so far seems to indicate or, or posit that Brexit is inherently something, inherently great, inherently terrible. It's inherently good for this group or inherently bad for that group. I don't think it is inherently good or bad. I think it really does depend on which group utilizes this this momentum that's being created for which purpose. And I think the, the, uh, the, the sort of analogy that we could look at here is when you're playing a, a game of chess, but you want to play, uh, you know, through with a different set of rules, or you want to play a different game entirely. You want to play checkers. You have to destroy the board. You have to take the pieces off the board and start again. And there's no guarantee in that moment when you destroy the board, you throw the pieces over, you you start from scratch. There's no guarantee that it's going to come out this way or that. It can only be manipulated, and you can try to make it go this way or that. I think that's the moment that we're in right now. The the board has been swept uh, off. And we're, we're seeing how the pieces are being put back on the board. So to a certain extent, Brexit is what we make of it and uh, or what we allow to to happen as a result of it, more so than it inherently is good or bad for any particular group. Mm -hmm. Well, when I look at which groups are celebrating it, uh, any, any group interested in sovereignty... Um, of course, there, there's a big one for you. And, and national sovereignty and groups that are trying to protect what they consider to be their, their culture and their ability to make decisions for themselves, those of us in that camp uh, instinctively almost celebrate Brexit once we know what it is. And the, the people who seem to be trashing Brexit uh, don't seem to know what the word sovereignty means. That it, it doesn't seem to mean anything to them, uh, and they're looking more at the nuts and bolts of the financial decision. Uh, do you see that at all? I see what you're saying. I would take it a step further, though, because mm -hmm. I'm certainly on the side of the people who believe sort of just in the abstract that the idea of UK secession from the European Union is is a step in the right direction. But I would posit it's only a step and that the words national sovereignty are themselves a, a an oxymoron mm -hmm. that misunderstand the situation. And that puts me in an interesting camp because I think I'm in a sense, on the side of the people who voted for Brexit, but I'm sure I would disagree with the vast majority of them on core political issues. I I don't think that nationalism is fundamentally what is opposed to this regional consolidation of powers in, in Brussels. Every argument that you can make for why the UK should not be governed from Brussels is an argument that you can make for why someone from Newcastle should not be governed from London. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, and we have to continue that process of decentralization to bring sovereignty back down to the individual, which I think is the ultimate goal that I'm aiming at, but I know is not the goal that most of the people who voted for Brexit are aiming at. So that's what complicates the matters here. It's not just that there's two sides, there's, you know, a dozen sides to this, or maybe more, depending, maybe, you know, as many voters as there are, there's that many sides, because everyone brings their own political perspective to it. But let's look on that other side of the debate, the, the, the people who want to centralize control. I think Again, this comes back down to the, the, the fundamental origin story of the European Union, or perhaps more accurately, the origin stories, because I don't mm -hmm. think there is one 
narrative of this, there are at least four that I can identify, and each one has a different meaning um, when we look at it in terms of Brexit. So there's the standard story of the European Union and how it came together, gradually consolidating through trade deals that became more and more powerful. You had the European coal and steel community, and then you had the, the Treaty of Rome that created the European Economic Community, and then uh, gradual consolidation from there, those original six states uh, ballooning to become the 28 and all of that. That's that's kind of the narrative that everyone knows about the European Union. And there is an element of truth to that. I mean, there are, uh, one can see the development of these various trade deals and people like Jean Monnet, who, are, who was called the father of Europe and everything. But when you actually start to look into these characters and who they were and what interests they were representing, you come up with some vastly different answers, one of which is the American involvement in the creation of the European Union was extremely important. You had uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard of The Telegraph has uh, outlined this extremely well. There was a lot of uh, American involvement from the Secretary of State Dean Acheson um, to the Truman administration generally were working extremely hard in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s to affect the rapprochement of France and Germany to try to form the closer partnership and union that became the basis of the European Union, precisely because the Americans uh, were worried about the growing Soviet threat, uh, the breakdown of the Yalta settlement when the Korean War broke out, those types of things signaling the beginning of the Cold War. They wanted a uh, united front in Europe to stand up against the Soviet Union. So it was extremely important from an American power elite perspective that Europe be consolidated into control. Uh, also, here's another origin story that you could tell. Back in 1944, August 10th of 1944 to be exact, there was a meeting at uh, Le Maison Rouge Hotel in Strasbourg, a.k.a. the Red House, from which came a report called the Red House Report. And you can look this up online. It was only revealed to the public about five or six years ago. But it is a report of this meeting on August 10th, 1944, that was some of the, the heads of German industry at that time, um, Alfred Krupp of Krupp Industries. Industries, and you had Friedrich Flick, and you had um, BMW, Siemens, Volkswagen representatives there meeting, obviously towards the end of World War II, knowing that the Nazis were going to go down, but German industrialists wanted to continue their industrial empire. So they were meeting, basically, how can we continue this? How can we further what's going on right now in Germany and this industrial output that we have? in the context of a post-war situation, they came up with the idea, we're going to need to form a European economic community that is, that is going to be led by Germany, really, ultimately. So you have, from that meeting and from some of the participants in that meeting, you have the formation of uh, the European economic community, and you can trace some of that, those linkages. So that's, that's a narrative that says that the European Union was really a, a, a sort of false front for German industrial power and, does, and economic interests. And I think there's an element of truth to that. There's another origin story you can okay. tell. Well, before you get to the next one, I have a question about that one. Uh, how much was that one dependent upon or under the thumb of the British bankers? Because they, after all, went to war against an independent German currency and the great success of Germany in the years following World War I. Germany had this incredible expansion and success, uh, economically speaking. And Churchill is quoted as saying he has to stop that. And so how did Germany see its potential given the the, the Smoot-Hawley tariff and the and all the uh, impediments that Britain threw at it uh, after World War II. Well, I think we have to understand that in the context of the uh, the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. and the funds that were then being directed um, into uh, Europe through, via the 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 same Anglo American bankster forces that had obviously worked um, on the opposite side in in the military sense throughout the war, mm -hmm. and uh, that was facilitated through the the bank for international settlements which was a uh, is the central bank of central banks and it was a key funding vehicle that ultimately helped work with the nazi regime when the nazis were in power and then continued mm -hmm. to fund the 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 redevelopment after 
um, after everything was blown up. It's it can be seen as that kind of financial linkage into with the rest of the world that that kept the operation flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think when we put it in that context, we see that the development of the, the the maintenance of German industry was always one of the goals. I don't think that the destruction of German industry was the goal of the the Anglo-American side, especially when you look at uh, the, the linkages between Standard Standard Oil and mm-hmm. IG Farben and all of those, I mean, direct uh, direct linkages that you can find between the oligarchs, the the, the oil class, um, the, the, some of the, the the banking interests uh, represented in people like, of course, the Rockefellers and whoever, mm-hmm. um, that, that directly tied into what was happening in Germany pre-war, during the war, and post-war. And I think that it was more about the, that continuation. And in fact, that leads into the other origin story I was going to tell, which is mm-hmm. um, the, the Bilderberg Group, of course, convened by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, but obviously a, a former SS member, who was meeting with David Rockefeller and uh, those types mm-hmm. in 1954, 1955. We have the leaked files from the 1955 meeting in West Germany. Those were released several years ago uh, online, but they were reported on even before that by BBC Radio in a report in 2003. And in those documents, they talk about the pressing need to bring the German people together with the other peoples of Europe into a common market. And they also say, quote, to arrive in the shortest possible time at the highest degree of integration beginning with a common European market. And perhaps most revealingly, they say, quote, it might be better to proceed through the development of a common market by treaty rather than by the creation of new high authorities. And then lo and behold, 25th of March, 1957, you get the the Treaty of Rome signed uh, two years later by at least one uh, member of the Bilderberg Group was uh, one of the signatories to the Treaty of Rome. So I, I think all of these different origin stories can tell slightly different ideas about what the European project meant to different sections of the power elite. And as a result, you could look at Brexit and say, oh, look, Brexit is the the American side of this is is celebrating because they always wanted to uh, drive a wedge between the the UK and Europe to to play them off against each other. Or you could say, oh, actually, no, the European Union is all about keeping Germany apart from Russia. And so we have to, you know, the, the, the American side of this would be more interested in that aspect of it. Or you could look at it as saying, well, if if Germany is the economic powerhouse of Europe, then maybe Brexit represents Britain taking themselves out of that power and p- posting themselves against the German power on the continent and starting a new type of European, inter-European war. Or you could, I mean, I again, you mm-hmm. can spin out multiple narratives from this, and I think all of them have some degree of validity. And it's a question, at this moment, I think there are different competing f- power factions within the the ruling elite, the powers that shouldn't be, whatever t- name you want to use, mm-hmm. uh, there are different competing factions that will all be scrambling to position themselves as best they can within this new reality. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that brings a more nuanced sense to this discussion rather than simply, you know, that this was a blow against globalism or this was all part of the globalist plan all along or, or, th- or things like that, which I think are just too simplistic. Mm-hmm. Well, the Oh, I, I'm <laughs> back to the average voter in in England was probably not thinking in the way that you have just described the process, which is the most sophisticated I've ever heard. And I've read an awful lot about Brexit. So congratulations. <laughs> I, th- I think the, the, the average voter was thinking a little bit more simplistically than that. But there's no point in, you know, going further into that. But uh, do you think that, say, the the public banks in Europe, like Sparkhausen, and there's a public bank in France. Uh, do you think uh, they will be affected in any way? Be- because still the IMF is ruling the world. Goldman Sachs is ruling the world. Still, still we have all of that. But what I've been reading is that the Brexit was a blow to them. And um, so you can go into your fourth reason or you can look at that question that I just threw out. I think I think the Bilderberg was fourth. <laughs> the uh, Red House report was third. Uh, second was uh, the CIA and uh, U.S. involvement, and then the first is the one that everyone knows. So those are the four that I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of banking and how this affects international banking structures, again, I think this is actually too early to be able to tell because at this point, uh, still, uh, they haven't even hit 
the Article 50 button in the Lisbon Treaty that will initiate the process for negotiation through which we discover what the ultimate form is going to take of what whatever you know uh, relationship Britain has with the European uh, Union after this point. And it is, to me, it is perfectly conceivable that maybe it won't go ahead at all. Maybe they will find a way to have a second referendum or something of that nature. Or maybe through the negotiations, it will end up being Britain in the European Union in all but name. You know, it'll just be that type of relationship and the status quo will be, will be maintained. So at this point, I don't think it's even clear whether the status quo will be affected at all mm-hmm. um, or if it will be completely upended. And that is a possibility. And again, that could work either against globalist interests or towards globalist interests, because at a certain point, uh, in order to upset the, the current the current game, the current way it's currently played, then the current actors as we know them will have to be cleared from the stage. So mm-hmm. could it mean could it mean the destabilization of structures like like NATO, um, like the IMF World Bank structure, like the United Nations? I mean, uh, there is a possibility that this can have knock-on effects like that. And again, those knock-on effects could be used toward the consolidation of power even further. You could say that, oh, well, this this destabilization is going to cause... Uh, one, one way that this scenario could play, play out, you could have Britain um, ultimately destabilizing the sort of European compact with the, uh, the UK part of it, which would cause the European Union to consolidate further in order to shore up their own strength. And that's, in fact, exactly what we saw just last week with a leaked document from the German and French foreign ministers calling for a European standing army, calling for a con- consolidated uh, uh, European asylum agency that's going to form a, a database and, and basically form a common border around Europe. Um, they're talking about the completion of the Economic Monetary Union basically the consolidation of all the power in the European Central Bank. So it's perfectly possible that although taking out Britain from the European Union is greatly destabilizing and a huge blow, it will actually cause the European Union to consolidate further and gain further control. Um, Again, with banking structures, we could see it playing out in that way, in a similar way. Whether or not this causes fundamental disruption to the IMF or something of that nature is, I think, extremely up in the air at the moment. And again, it play, it depends on which way this plays out politically. Going back to what you said earlier, that probably very few, if any, of the uh, voting public was thinking in these terms when they were casting their vote, I think you're exactly right about that. But I would hope, I mean, I don't want to say hope, that's, that's such a horrible word anyway, but yeah. uh, I, it should be at this point for anyone who does understand the greater implications of this, the greater potential for this to be a truly anti-globalist sort of uh, event, to be at that moment, at this moment, at this inflection point, informing the public about these issues in order to make this the discussion point rather than the sort of stuck on stupid debate, you know, mm-hmm. oh, national sovereignty, it's all about kicking the immigrants out or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, when we start to look at the greater uh, geopolitical strategy that's going on here and the fact that this can, there is a th- at least a theoretical way this could play out to the benefit of those who want to see power devolve from institutions like the European Union. It's our duty to be informing people about that so that that becomes the debate rather than these debates, which can so easily be spun off and played on by the same interests that have been basically ruling over the system for at least the last six decades since the formation of the EU. Now, what about uh, Ellen Brown's article about Italy, where it looks as if there's this eight ball behind the eight ball situation where Italy is now in a very interesting position because it can't possibly pay off its debt. It's not going to do anything about it except maybe more austerity. And uh, it can use what England did as a leverage to force the EU, the banks, to pay more attention to the needs of Italy. Not that it's not entirely selfish on their part, but, um, and and, um, one of my guests, uh, Badak Merrick, um, has written a scathing criticism of the greed and, and spoiled a situation of the of the people of Europe and how they're living off the backs of the third world, etc. But anyway, uh, what does Italy's move have to do with uh, with Brexit? Well, the Italian banking system is in complete. 
turmoil. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, I mean, the latest indication of that just on Sunday, the European Commission specifically authorized the Italian government for to uh, do an emergency 150 billion euro liquidity support program for their banking sector. Um, that's just one of the many gaping wounds in the eurozone right now that is has been hemorrhaging for years, has been kept alive with spit in a prayer, um, and is uh, obviously always in danger of, uh, of falling apart. Oh, wait, I it, forgot to say this is WGDR Plainfield, WGDH Hardwick. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. And and this, I, I mean, this is always a potential domino situation. And I think in the same vein, we can see Brexit as... Uh, it, it is certainly a chance for each and every member of the European Union to try to redefine that relationship in a way that best suits them. And we would expect that to be the default position of any and all members of the Union. That's why I think it was so interesting last week when that document from the French and German foreign ministers was leaked, um, that that was being presented, this idea for a European standing army of some sort of standing military, the, the asylum agency, the more power in the ECB, that was being presented to the vice grad group of companies that includes Poland and Hungary, two basically enemies of Brussels, very, very un unwilling, unhappy partners in the EU situation right now. In fact, Poland was specifically chided by the EU in an extremely rare event, I, I believe just earlier last month, um, for the way that they were handling a constitutional crisis in their courts. Um, so there, I, obviously, these peripheral countries, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know how else to describe them. Obviously, France and Germany are the core of the European Union project. Um, these peripheral countries are all going to be trying to struggle and chomp at the bit and see what they can get out of this and threatening to leave. Uh, we've already seen several countries having at least the idea floated by uh, opposition parties and and people who are hoping to uh, to gain from this uh, to to have a referendum of their own. Hey, how come Britain can have one and we can't? And that again can be used as a, at the very least as a bargaining chip um, with France and Germany to try to get a better deal out of all of this. So I think that would be one of the logical outcomes of this. We're going to see that strain coming from each and every corner, especially the the so-called pigs like Italy mm -hmm. that uh, that have been in this financial turmoil, turmoil and require and and want European uh, assistance, European Central Bank bailout. They all want access to that, but they want it on the best possible terms. And I think they're going to be using the Brexit crisis as a way to, to basically renegotiate those terms. Okay. Now, do you see, uh, I interviewed Scott Baker last Monday, and we talked about maybe the regrowth of alternative currencies. And do you see that? I mean, in Japan, uh, Bernard Leotard wrote years ago about the many different alternative complementary currencies that function in Japan. Um, so you're probably familiar with the whole routine. Do you see any of those popping up uh, here and there, like in, in England, for example? It's well. It, it is already happening. It already does exist. Uh, there's the Brixton pound and and other ventures like that. Uh, uh, complementary currencies. There are alternative currencies that already exist in Britain. We saw Bitcoin spiking in. Mm -hmm. Uh, as Brexit was happening, I think there were multiple reasons for that, but I think Brexit probably contributed to that. Um, so there are obviously signs that people are looking for different ways of trying to get around uh, around the pound. <laughs> as we see that the uh, the valuation of these currencies really does depend on these uh, uh, these political contingencies that no one can really plan for effectively. So it's going to uh, it's be in your best interest to try to find a way around that. I constantly and 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 as much as i can hammer home the point that alternative and community currencies are really going to be essential going forward um especially if the type of uh, financial calamity that happened in 2008 happens again soon, uh, which a lot of people are expecting. But even if it doesn't, I think that the only way forward is to disentangle ourselves from the, the banking system as it exists. And the mm -hmm. only way to do that is to create the communities which form the basis of these systems. Because ultimately, mon a monetary system is only as good as the community that supports it. And because the Federal Reserve you know, has the, the gun of the IRS uh, pointed at people metaphorically or literally, mm -hmm. um, um, they can get away with basically, you know, creating this currency that that becomes uh, ubiquitous. But 
for people who are trying to start an alternative for or complementary currency, it requires the community first. You can't build put the horse uh, the cart before the horse. You have to build the community first, which is why we saw, for example, in Greece um, during the the Greece crisis, and mm-hmm. as you know, the the euro liquidity was uh, crisis was hitting, and people were having and problems with Vera, the ATMs. Verifacus has weighed in on Brexit too, by the way. But yeah, go ahead. Interesting. Well, let's get back to that in a minute. But um, uh, uh, it, during the Greek crisis, you you did see, and there was even mainstream reporting of some of these types of uh, exchanges, uh, community exchanges, and other ideas that were popping up for ways for people to to trade without euros. Uh, one of them was in Volos, uh, Volos, Greece. They, they had uh, a, a community trading system, a let system. Um, and those types of things are great, but when they are formed, or at, at any rate, when they become popular after the crisis sets in, it's already too late. Um, and that's why you see, I mean, the Volos idea didn't exactly take over, and it's not it's not spreading, and now everyone's you know off the euro um, because it's just a thing for of convenience for the moment. Okay, we need to trade. Let's do this. That's why I think it's important to focus on the community building now, while there is a moment of at least opportunity to do so before the main crisis hits and everyone's just scrambling like chickens with their head heads cut off. Because in that situation, the people with the power and the, the money as it already exists are the ones that are in control, and they get to drop down, you know, with from with their golden parachutes for, mm-hmm. with their trillions in uh, bailouts and whatever to in order to steer the economy into the next uh, off the next cliff and everyone else is just kind of you know working for scraps from the table yeah. so i think that i think it is exceptionally important but i think that the community that underlies alternative and complementary currencies is the real core of that and has to be built starting now starting yesterday really yeah well the discussion that we've had in the vermont independence movement over many many years is exactly what you just said it's it is a chicken and egg problem of if you can't get the community mobilized you can't do it and you can't mobilize the community unless they see the problem and by that point the powers that be step in and say we'll save you and the community goes oh good and then we're forgotten the independence movement is forgotten um, we have a a new currency that uh, one of our members has come up with called vcoin and he'll be talking about that on wednesday and i'll be talking about the what actually you and I have been talking about uh, this morning, uh, how the community needs to sort of come together with a sense of, well, survival for one thing, but a sense of public good on the other hand. Um, Now, you said something earlier that is absolutely crucial, but I'm not sure that listeners got it or, or understand it. You said the IRS pointing the gun at your head. Uh, I don't think people realize that the IRS is the constabulary for a, a lot of what goes on in the world. And if, I've sa- if I haven't said that right, correct me, but uh, can you elaborate a, a bit on the statement that you said? Well, of course, a currency uh, is only, especially a credit, a debt-based currency, is only as good as the theoretical ability to fulfill that debt, uh, the, uh, the, the debt that is extracted, which forms the basis of it. So mm-hmm. in a system like the U.S. banking system, where 95% of the monetary supply is debt created, uh, owing back to privately owned banks yep. at interest, of course, then really the the fundamental underlying part of that system is the people's obligation to pay that debt and the treasury as a subsection of that which issues obviously the bonds which create the money for government to function uh, is is enforced by the irs its enforcement agency which oversees the tax code which obligates people to pay their tribute to the government um like every major empire throughout history, every major government throughout history has had its enforcement arm to seize tribute from the public. The IRS is the American empire's enforcement arm. And it's important for Americans to understand, if they do not yet do so, if they do not yet understand this, that ultimately, the obviously, the issuing power of uh, the ability to issue money does not rest on this ability to have a debt-based system backed up by an IRS. That is a contingency of history. It does not have to be organized that way. But it is organized that way so that now the the IRS is obligating people to pay their debts to the government, not again so that the government can function. That mm-hmm. is a lie that has been sold to the public, yep. but really as a way of securing the debt that backs up the system. Mm-hmm. Yes, people don't understand that if you have a currency that is issued by 
the the government that it is credit based, then the government can uh, eliminate that currency as need be. So it's not inflationary necessarily um so it's very hard to, to explain to people the difference between currency that is spent into existence like the greenbacks under lincoln and the colonial script it's i've i've been devoting many programs to that on this radio station uh and so i i think that listeners here uh, pretty well get it and every now and then people will say to me well what's the matter with the state of vermont why don't they blah blah, blah? well the the powers that be can pretty much get what they want. And so we're kind of stuck. But again, we'll be devoting a lot of, I, th- I hope, uh, Wednesday when we meet, we'll be devoting the discussion to that kind of sovereignty, the, the issuance of money, and it comes from the community. Ultimately, it does. And it, when you think about it in either system, it comes from on the back of the workers. It is the workers' obligation to pay back to the banks the money that they create out of nothing that underlies the, the system as it exists now. If people just realized it is their blood and sweat and tears and labor that underlies this this money that is uh, that the banks get to create out of nothing at interest uh, just by for virtue of being banks, if people understand that and start to take that power away from the banks, which they can do, they can start forming the communities that form the basis of alternative and complementary systems. That's the beginning of real revolution. I, I think until that point, until people understand that level of sovereignty, I think everything else is window dressing, which is why Brexit, again, can be either way. It, what, what, what is happening now could be a great thing. It could be a terrible thing. Because it depends on the consciousness, the understanding of the people who are living through this and whether or not they choose to start using those powers that they already have, that they just have to understand is in their hands right now. Mm -hmm. And we have to look back through history at what the powers that be have done to countries and individuals who have had a certain amount of success with complementary currencies like colonial scrip and like greenbacks and like uh, when Kennedy issued the silver certificates. These were not taken lightly by the powers that be and wars were the result. Assassinations have been the result. And my personal take, and I think Ellen Brown agrees with me here, is that the countries that uh, Wesley Clark named as on the chessboard that had to go were all countries that had independent currencies. Yes, I agree. I agree completely with what you're saying. In essence, um, the only thing that I would dispute is uh, Kennedy and Executive Order 11110 Mm -hmm. was not about the uh, silver certificate issuance. Of course it was, but it was actually uh, a change that he made in order to put it back under the purview of the uh, the Treasury Secretary as a way of winding that program down, which it did after after his assassination. I understand people think that he was assassinated because he was going to bring back the greenbacks or something of that sort. It was part of a regular issuance of silver currency that happened, silver-backed currency that happened on a regular basis. He made the change to make it basically so that would stop happening um that's uh, one of those things that i know has been perpetuated since uh, for for decades now about mm-hmm. kennedy but i think it's fundamentally got it backwards well thank you very much for that because uh i was one of the people who had a minor I, i've read uh, the brilliant book called jfk and the unspeakable and i've interviewed uh, jim douglas the author and um he did not even mention that in his voluminous book it's a great great book so i asked him what he thought about that and he said that it's a possibility which is about where i started (laughs) in the first place but you have just explained that it wasn't uh because it the issuance of the silver certificates were not what we think it was yes and if people want to read more about that uh, g edward griffin who literally wrote the book on the Federal Reserve, has a a great blog post up where he talks about that and he goes through the actual executive order and what it actually says and how it changed the law and what that actually means. And he spells it out in black and white. Okay. Well, without forgetting what you just agreed with, which is that, (laughs) that, I mean, that's pretty, I think what you agreed with is much more important than what we just said about silver. Yes, I agree too, yes. (laughs) And and so the attack against the Arab world, uh, again, Ellen Brown and I, and I guess a few other people on the planet uh, think that this was 
the, the central bankers who could not tolerate countries functioning on their own that were not under the thumb of the IMF, the European Central Bank, Wall Street, etc. And so you, t- you pretty much agree with that. Yes, I, I would only say that, again, I think we have to understand that think, large agendas do not con- happen for one reason and one reason mm-hmm. only. They happen when a number of different interests converge. So absolutely, the war in the Arab world right now is at least partly exactly what you're saying. And because, obviously, um, Islamic c- countries do not take kindly to usury, mm-hmm. um, uh, so there, there's a different banking system, which does not play well with the uh, the banking system that the the one worlders want for it to rule over everyone. So uh, absolutely, that is one of the main drivers. But it, I wouldn't say it's the only one. Okay. Yeah, I wrote a paper in which I said uh, in 1694, usury was bad, but then the banks formed and banking was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it was. We just just change the name and move on. From there. Um, Well, this has been uh, very enlightening as well as uh, rewarding because you've given so many different perspectives to the Brexit problem. Do you see, um, we had a long talk about Gladio on another program, do you see them playing any role whatsoever in what's happening in Europe now, whatever's happening in Europe now, forgetting Brexit or just in in general, what do you see that they might be up to? Well, I, I, let's just look at the original Gladio as the historical example, mm-hmm. staging terrorist events and blaming them on political enemies in order to re- achieve certain political results mm-hmm. that happened repeatedly in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, the, the obvious parallel is what's happening right now with uh, the, I mean, what happened in Paris last year, um, what's uh, continuing to happen with, with these types of terrorist attacks. We have to look at them from that angle. And uh, when we do, I think that the idea that they're could be an agenda towards stirring up the very type of nationalist sentiments that are at, at, at once responsible for, for the Brexit, I think largely, I think we can agree that a lot of the people who voted for Brexit probably did because mm-hmm. let's get rid of these the, the sort of Muslims and uh, you know the, t- the terrorism that's happening. I think that has to be part of it. And that begs the question of whether the nationalist opposition to globalism is in fact being incited as part of a larger chess game to uh, to towards an end game of, okay, well, now it's going to be nationalists that are going to be broken up into their nation states so that they can be more effectively divided and conquered. And uh, that has to be one of the, the possibilities for all of this. Wow. Well, that's something to think about. Um, so that there could be a hand that we're not supposed to see. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but there could be two curtains. <laughs> there's the curtain <laughs> There's the curtain we're not supposed to look behind, and then there's the curtain behind the curtain that we're not supposed to look behind. Yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. I sometimes use the analogy 3D chess. It's not... Everyone's looking at the chessboard like a two-dimensional thing. Well, here's the black players and here's the white mm-hmm. players you know team team a team b but there no there's a third level the third dimension to this and and they they drop down into the board and that that's kind of the gladio, gladio operators intelligence agencies the uh, the dirty tricks department that can manipulate events like that and manipulate public perceptions in 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 ways that are not intuitive people think nationalism is opposed to globalism i think it might it's just a stepping stone on the road to globalism so stir up the nation state sentiments mm-hmm. break people apart and then more effectively gather them into regional and uh, global uh, yeah. structures well what you said at the beginning create the problem and then step in and solve it exactly right that that's a that's sort of the age-old way of fooling the people and the it people, unfortunately continues to work I yeah think, to it, our it, it's amazing how well, it, well one of the things that I still scratch my head over is how people fall for the exact same lie every time. I mean, my horses wouldn't do that. A dog <laughs> wouldn't do that. But people do it. because I, It just amazes me. But anyway. I, fortunately, <laughs> I fear your incredulity. Um, I, it boggles my mind, but... I don't know. I, it really is the question: Will will humanity ever grow up, or will it continue its uh, uh, sort of adolescent stage? Mm-hmm. And if so, then I, I think we are playing playing a game for all the marbles at this point. And I think it is not long before a, a truly 
not only global, but uh, a, a consolidation of control, the likes of which no tyrant in history could ever have dreamed of. Control down to the genomic level and all of these crazy technologies that are coming into view will make, I think, the, the, the coming generations um, truly the deciding one for the future of humanity. Uh, this is not a, a small, you know, historical moment we're living through. This is truly a turning point for the human species. And either we win this or we lose it all. Yeah. And and since uh, since Obama was running for president, I noticed on the face of the earth a move for centralization. But on the other hand, people like me who were afraid of that, who saw it for perhaps what it was, or maybe even worse than it was, but I don't think so, uh, who were moving toward decentralization and looking at Schumacher and, and the, whole, the, the whole culture of individual self-sufficiency as something that was good and that something sh- that should be saved along with the culture, the historical culture. Um, and the powers that be seem to want to break up that culture. They want us to forget. But. Yes, I, I think you just hit the nail on the head, the idea of bringing it back down to individuals working in cooperation with those in their community and, and being self-sufficient in that manner. That is the real enemy. So if you are one of these global controllers or would-be global controllers and you are trying to set up these institutions like the EU that you know are deeply unpopular and that bring up these nationalist sentiments, the question would be, well, how do you manipulate those nationalist settlements in order to get people further trapped in your system? Mm. And And if you think like that, then you can see what some of the possible outcomes and meanings of events like Brexit could be and how we can avoid that by, again, taking it back down to the local level and what we can actually affect in our communities and through the creation of alternative structures. Well, I'll try to remember what you just said and spit it out on Wednesday when I give my talk. (laughs) Well, the program (laughs) program is over. Do you have like 15 seconds of anything else you'd like to mention? I think that's going to be it for today, Um, but uh, obviously this is going to be playing out in the years ahead, and uh, we're just starting along this path right now, so it's going to be interesting, if nothing else. Okay, well, I will post this on SoundCloud, or Tony will, in a few days, and so everybody can just link to it there, and you're free to do whatever you want with it. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. The Federal Reserve, the heart of the American banking system. For over 100 years, it has operated in the shadows, controlling America's money supply in total secrecy. So all that information is available uh, in our commercial paper program. And who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks. Any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. Can you tell us who they are? No. Until now. 100 years ago, in 1913, the Fed was created. Fractional reserve banking. The legal authority to do it. Takeover of monetary policy. Are conducted by the Federal Reserve Banks. They are banks. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Century of Enslavement. The history of the Federal Reserve. Watch the documentary for free at corporatereport.com slash Federal Reserve and purchase a copy on DVD to help support The Corbett Report today.